morning folks, and I do bid you a warm welcome to another virtual service. But God willing, if they fortnight, we will be in our Newry Church building on Easter Sunday to celebrate the risen Saviour. And we do look forward to that. But thank you once again for joining with us online. Can I just highlight the Good Friday service in Morn Point? Again, you're more than welcome to join us there on Good Friday. Again, the guidelines, the social distancing, the sanitising of your hands will be in place. And obviously face coverings must be worn throughout the service. That will be on Good Friday at 7.30pm. And then, as I say, Easter Sunday at 11 a.m. in our Newry Church building. And Easter Sunday morning, there'll be a dawn service at 6.30 a.m. up at the Flagstaff. There'll only be a few of us there, but you can look in online, even from the comfort of your own bed, before you get out of bed, you can join in worship. It'll be a short service from the Flagstaff. And then this Wednesday night, God willing, our Bible study, um, if you would like to join in that, please contact myself and I'll send you the details for that. will be on soon. And then finally, can I say a word of thanks to all those who have contacted me over this past break. And who's, who have condemned, who's offered um, their help and support within their Nuri or Warren Point Congregation, I should say, sorry, with regards to vandalism to the Boundary Wall. We were saddened to see that. We know God works his ways or not his ra our ways. And through that damage, where well, this brought the church together, maybe even more so, but the community. And we've accepted an offer of help for the repairing of that wall and that will be done over the next couple of weeks. So can I put on record my thanks to those who have offered help. It is greatly appreciated by all within the Worm Point congregation. We're here this morning to worship God. And as I call the worship this morning, I want to read from Psalm 63. Psalm 63 verse 1. O oh God, you are my God, earnestly I seek you, my soul thirsts for you, my body longs for you, in a dry and weary land where there is no water. Amen. And that's what we seek to do in this service of worship this morning, to seek God, to long for God's presence amongst us our soul at first for him and we are in a land that has forsaken sadly God and his will for each of us and more so the province as a whole so let us join together now in worship with our first hymn of praise from Mission Praise 564 Praise to the Lord the Almighty, the King of creation.
Let us come before God in prayer. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, as we enter into your presence this morning in this service of worship, we do offer to you our praise for all that you do. Indeed, all that you are doing and have done in the past in our lives as individuals, but even within our church families. Lord God, we acknowledge this morning that we would be totally lost and empty without you. Our lives would be incomplete. Sadly, Lord, even with you in our lives, we fail you so often. We let you down. We don't speak up when we're given the opportunities to do so. We stay silent. We go with the crowd. Lord God, give us that strength can only be found in you to speak up when given opportunities, to share your good news, to say when things are wrong, not consistent with your will. Indeed, Lord, forgive us for, well, for our failings. Our failings and Maybe even those wrong thoughts and actions which we have committed over the past week since last we joined together in worship of you, the holy and living God. Lord God, help us to walk a closer review each day of our lives. Help us to instill within each one of us a desire to know more about you, to get deeper into your word, to speak to you in prayer daily. Not only requesting and asking you for help, but thanking you for your many blessings you shower upon each one of us. Lord God, help us in this special time together. Help us as we later in our service turn to those last lot of verses from Philippians. He us, Lord. And now we join together in the words that Jesus Christ has taught his disciples to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. <coughs> Turning once again to the letter to the church in Philippi. Philippians chapter 4, commencing at verse 10, reading verses 10 to the end of the chapter. It's entitled in the NIV, Thanks for their gifts. Let us hear the word of God. I rejoice greatly in the Lord, that at last you have renewed your concern for me. Indeed, you have, not, you have been concerned but you have had no opportunity to show it. I am not saying this because I am in need, for I have learned to be content, whatever the circumstances. I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every circumstance, whether well fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. I can do everything through him who gives me strength. Yet it was good of you to share in my troubles. 
Moreover, as you Philippians know, in the early days of your acquaintance with the gospel, when I set out from Mar Macedonia, not one church shared with me in the matter of giving and receiving, except you only. For even when I was in Thessalonica, you sent me aid again and again when I was in need. Not that I am looking for a gift, but I am looking for what may be credited to your account. I have received full payment, and even more, I am amply supplied. Now that I have received from Epaphroditus the gifts you sent, they are a fragrant offering, an acceptable sacrifice, pleasing to God. And my God will meet all your needs according to his glorious riches in Christ Jesus. To your God and Father be glory for ever and ever. Amen. Greet all the saints in Christ Jesus, the brothers who are with me send greetings. All the saints send you greetings, especially those who belong to Caesar's household. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Amen. And we trust that God will add a blessing to this reading of his holy word. Boys and girls and young people, I want to speak to you for a few moments as normal this morning. I've got a few items with me today, but I wonder, thinking ahead to next Sunday, do you know anything special about next Sunday? I wonder what you're thinking at home. I've only one person I can ask here with me this morning, and I'm going to ask, Andrea, do you know anything special about next Sunday? Andrea's saying no, but she told me during the week she wasn't looking forward to it. Can you remember now? Next Sunday, no. Still a blank look on Andrea's face. Well, next Sunday, all of us will lose an hour of sleep in bed because our clocks will go forward. As was known as British summertime begins. And that will mean it will be lighter, much later in the day. It won't be dark to later. And thinking about darkness, I've got a few different types of light with me this morning. I want to show them to you now. And the first light is this big work light. And sadly, I have no plug near me I can plug into. Well, there's a plug on the end and that produces a really bright light. That's really useful if you're working maybe outside or out in the garage and you can hang this up and it will shine in wherever you need it to shine. But you must have it plugged in. There's no use just on its own. You must have it plugged in. Did I even use this up in the roof space? I have a plug up on our roof space and it's very useful up there to let me see when I'm up in it, what you're doing so you'll fall over. So that's the first a halogen light in that. And then maybe a light, maybe you're more familiar with a torch. Maybe you can see it shining there this morning. And that again is very useful, especially when maybe you're out walking at night time. And you maybe can put that torch in your pocket, very small and helpful, and you can take it with you. But that torch would be of no help and of no use unless it had a couple of things inside. And I've screwed it off the top off there to show you what's needed. Batteries. Batteries are needed to power that torch. Because if I put that back on now with no batteries on it, Well, the light won't come on. It's of no use. But once, hopefully, I put these batteries back in. Well, you can see it already. It's working. Because the batteries are where they need to be. 
that's a useful hand torch. And then I was given this little box. I'm not going to tell you what it says on the outside for a moment or two. But there's a little torch in this box. And there is the little torch contained within, and there's two bulbs. And I can turn it on. It's maybe not just as bright as the other one, but it still is pretty good. But this torch is powered by itself in one way. You flick this little switch and it brings out the button to the side. And when you press that button in and out a few times, it generates power that will power in that little torch. So that's very useful. You don't need to remember to buy batteries. You don't need to plug it in. But you still need to put some work in. Just won't happen. You know, as I thought about those torches, that electric light, the battery light, and even that little self sufficient light in its own way. I thought about this passage from Philippians that we're looking at today. And in particular, one verse. Philippians 4, verse 13. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I told you I would tell you what it said on the box. That is what it actually says on the box. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Press on. It says, press on. You know, all of us at times try to do things on our own. Try to do things that we just aren't maybe cut out for doing. But we need help, Ruth. We need practice, Ruth. We do not even as adults, even your mums and dads, granny and granddads maybe do that. Try to do it on their own strength. You know, each of these lights required help. The first one required to be plugged in to the, to the electricity. The second one required batteries. And this one even required some power to be generated. You know, we need strength also. And who do we get that strength from? Where we can get that strength from Jesus Christ. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. There'll be times we think we're doing well in life. We think we're going through it with no problems. But difficulties will arise. We'll need to be connected to Christ. And that doesn't mean like the light, just being plugged in now and again when needed. It means being connected to Jesus Christ each day of our lives by reading his word, the Bible, by speaking to him in prayer, just as we were to speak to a friend or a family member, so too we need to speak to Jesus Christ each day. This little light, and it says on it, hand pump flashlight, no batteries ever. But you know, we've Jesus Christ with all that we'll ever need. He'll help us through those difficult times. He'll rub us through those happy and joyful times. He'll be ever present. He'll never let us down. But we need to get involved with him. We need to make use of him and allow him to work in our lives and and use us for his glory and purpose. So I hope as you think about the light changing next week, or the clocks going forward and having more daylight, you'll think about shining your light for Jesus Christ. 
and you think of that verse from Philippians 4 verse 13, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Isn't that great to know? I hope that boys and girls and young people, you'll know that at a young age. Don't leave it too late. Let God work in your life for all of your life. And give him the praise and glory that he alone is due. We're going to sing your hymn now. And there's one that he's done on Children's Day last year. Nothing is impossible. Nothing is impossible. Nothing is impossible. Now let's turn once again to God's Word. Reading this time from the Old Testament, from the book of Psalms, Psalm 62, reading verses 1 to 8. My soul finds rest in God alone. 
My salvation comes from him. He alone is my rock and my salvation. He is my fortress. I shall never be shaken. How long will you assault a man? Will all of you throw him down? His leaning wall is tightering the fence. They fully intend to topple him from his lofty place. They take delight in lies with their mouths they bless, but in their hearts they curse. Find rest, O my soul, in God alone. My hope comes from him. He alone is my rock and my salvation. He is my fortress. I shall not be shaken. My salvation and my honour depend on God. He is my mighty rock, my refuge. Trust in him at all times. O people, pour out your hearts to him. For God is our refuge. Amen. Let us now come to God in prayer. Let us pray. Loving and heavenly Father, may you indeed be our refuge. May you indeed be our strength, our hope and our salvation. We thank you this morning, Lord, for the truths contained within your holy word the Bible. Lord, we give thanks that you have put into it all that we need in this life. For God, sometimes we question what's contained within. Lord, we know that in your own perfect timing, you will reveal to each one of us just when we need it what maybe a passage of scripture means. Lord, we would pray this morning that you would do just now the needs of our lives as individuals, as Christians seeking to follow your way, but also as church families, Lord. We pray this morning that we would look to you for our guidance. We would look to you for our direction. We'll do so through reading your word and speaking to you in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you that even in the past week, through vandalism and difficulties within Warren Point, your goodness shone through. Lord, we give thanks to you this morning for the ray you have made a difficult situation. And you've turned it around and used it, maybe even to teach us a lesson. To be more dependent on you and less self-sufficient. Lord, this morning we remember once again those ill and recovering from illnesses. We pray your continued presence with each one. You know each of them by name and our congregations. And we pray that even now, as we speak to you in prayer, that you would draw nearer to each one. Lord, we especially think of our elderly members of, con- of our congregations, both Nyari and Warren Point. Lord, we thank you for what they mean to us, each one. Lord, we thank you for their safety and protection that you have granted them over this past difficult year. Lord, we do look forward to getting back out and joining in worship with each one when they feel as safe and appropriate to do so. Lord God, we pray for our prophets this day. Remember those in power over us, those up in storming. 
And Lord, we do pray for our politicians. And we pray for wisdom. And we pray for direction for them and guidance. Above all, Lord, we pray that they would know you. If they don't already do so, know you as their own personal Saviour and Lord. Lord God, as we look around our province, indeed the world at large, we can become dismayed. Because people have forgotten you, the Creator God. Many people have left you, went their own way. Lord, we pray this morning people will see their errors of their ways and turn back to you or come to you for the first time that they receive within us as Christians the difference, the holiness you give to our lives. Lord God, help us each one to be equipped to fully share the good news of the gospel. To do it in the way in which you want us to do it. Maybe not praying faithfully in our own homes. Maybe not helping in some way around the church buildings. Or maybe it's offering help and assistance to our neighbours or work colleagues. Let us do all those seeking to bring glory to your name. Lord, be with us now as we turn to your word. Refresh us, revive us, renew us. Indeed, connect with us this morning, we pray. For us in Christ Jesus' perfect name, we pray. Amen. Today, we get to the final verses of Philippians. It's been quite a journey. And I hope it's been a journey that has encouraged you and challenged you somewhat. But this last part of the letter is Paul's thank you note. He had intended to write them a thank you note because they sent some support some financial support with their beloved Epaphroditus. But when Paul learned about the conflict two Roman leaders in the church were having with one another, Paul's thank you note turned into a fully fledged letter filled with gospel teachings on grace and truth. In this letter we find some of the most beautiful teachings of the New Testament. After he's done giving the Philippians instructions on Christian faith and living, Paul ends his letter with an elaborate thank you. In his final thank you note, we also find some insight into Paul's personal financial affairs. We can actually see what his philosophy in life is, or faith, was in regards to receiving financial support. We also see his philosophy of life or faith in regards to giving and receiving within the church. Verse 10. I rejoice greatly in the Lord that at last you have renewed your concern for me. Indeed you have been concerned but you had no opportunity to so short. Paul is now expressing his own joy that the Philippian church was deeply concerned about the situation, especially his financial situation. His words, at last, you have renewed your concern for me. May it sound as if they had abandoned their concern for his well-being, but had now renewed it. But that wasn't the case at all. 
for a few years as we can read in verses 15 and 16. The Philippians had not sent Paul any financial support. But we're going to read in them verses Ren that had done so previously. But it wasn't because of their lack of concern, but rather as Paul saying it, they had no opportunity to do so. They weren't able to. You see, after he was arrested in Jerusalem for the gospel, they lost touch with him. They lost connection with him. Therefore, they had no opportunity to show their concern for him by supplying him with financial support, as they had done so after their conversion and the church was established in Philippi. Look at the words which Paul uses in verse 10. Trice he mentions their concern for him. Trice. Concern comes from love. And Paul loved them because they were his spiritual children in essence. This morning if you are a parent, you cannot but love your children dearly. Even if they are the worst children in the world, you'll still see the best in them. That gift of love is God-given. It's much more than an instinct. It is very much part of your human constitution. Why? Well, because God made you and I in his image, in the image of God. And God's very essence is love. The Bible tells us now, God is love. 1 John 4, verse 8. God made us in his image so that we might recognise love and embrace it. See, all love comes from God. Paul was loved by God and embraced that love when he was the last person on earth to imagine that God would love a person such as him. Let's not forget, Paul was once called Saul. He had done everything against Christianity he could do. When he embraced the love of God, he too could freely love others. How much more than his own spiritual children. Paul loved these Philippian Christians dearly as his own children. His love for them always burned brightly in his heart, even years after last hearing from them. There's nothing I love more than meeting people. And to me, that's one of the biggest, well, disappointments of this past year, not being able to connect with people in their own homes. There's been occasions where I've been able to do it, but not to the extent I would wish to do it. I have a desire to get to know you, to get to know each of you as individuals, to know what makes you tick, to know what you love in life. And I want to share with you my love, my love of Jesus Christ. But as much as Paul loved them, they too loved him as well. They went both ways. Now it's also not an instinct that's part of their constitution, especially that they were Paul's children born to him in Christ. I thank you this morning as your minister for the love and concern shown to me over the past year when I haven't been around. And that's very much evident, and still is, as I hopefully get back to full strength. The church of Philippi loved him as their spiritual father. They were concerned for him. Years have passed by, but they hadn't lost their concern for him, as far as well being. They hadn't forgotten that he was a mere man dedicated to God's work and would often be in need of support as he served a God's purpose. They hadn't forgotten to love him, to be concerned for him, to watch out for him. They mightn't have seen him in the, some years, but they still loved him. 
You see, they had a connection, a bond. Jesus Christ. Verses 11 and 12. I'm not saying this because I am in need. For I have learned to be content, whatever the circumstances. I know what it is to be in need. I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every circumstance. Whether well fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in all. They might have lost, lost touch with Paul, but they were still concerned for him. Paul rejoiced at this because in, in it he realised that the spirit of the life and divine love still filled their hearts to overflowing. He wanted to make it perfectly clear his joy was in their love and concern, not in that financial support they gave. It's clear that Paul had never made an appeal to them for any help financially. And here's why he had never felt he needed to appeal to them to support them. What's he saying in verse 10? I have learned to be content and whatever the circumstances. He again says in verse 11, I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation. Isn't that amazing? In his words, we really find great insight and truth and wisdom that each of us should adopt ourselves in our Christian walk of faith. Paul makes it clear that he had not asked for their financial support. Because he's learned something. He says he's learned to be content in all circumstances. Not in some, but in all. In any and every situation, he has learned to be content. The word content is very closely related to joy. And you see up on the screen, you don't know, but Philippians is a book of joy. It's often referred to. And so, this contentment or being content was like a child, like a wee baby. When is that baby content or happy? When it's being held by its parents. When it's being held in its parents' arms. They don't understand maybe what difficulties or trials or, or suffering their parents may be going through. They don't understand if their parents are facing happiness in life or bad times. The child instead would be content in all circumstances as long as it has its parents. Paul's sense of contentment was the same. He had Jesus Christ. The only difference is that Paul understood his own circumstances. They had no bearing on his contentment. They didn't change his state of contentment. You see, most people, you and I, in life let our circumstances dictate whether or not we are content or otherwise. They're often dissatisfied and discontent and upset about many things. Isn't it true when things are going our way, we're content for a while until things aren't going our way anymore. Then we get annoyed, we get frustrated. Paul, however, was different. He didn't let the circumstances of his life decide whether or not he was content or not. The circumstances of his life, as the Bible bears witness to, were often unfavourable. They were often difficult. As often as he was in good and favourable circumstances, he was also in difficult and unbearable circumstances that we could only imagine. But what was his confession? I have learned to be content whatever the circumstances. I have learned the secret of being content in every and every situation. As much as circumstances should not dictate our sense of joy, 
So also our circumstances must not dictate our sense of contentment. How then can we be content in any and every situation? Well only when we're fully comfortable in our circumstances. When we're not greedy for more than what we already have. We don't have that I want attitude. When we're trusting God's love for us even when our circumstances aren't so favourable. When our heart is full. When I know that I'm lacking nothing. Because God has given me all I need. The word content in the Greek language means self-sufficient. But that's not the Christian meaning of the word content. A Christian cannot cannot be self-sufficient and offer themselves. We're only self-sufficient or full when we're in Christ. If Christ lives in us, we are sufficient or adequate in the demands or needs of life. If Christ lives in us, we are not greedy for more. Or nor are we annoyed at the little we may have in life. Instead, those who experience Christ daily in their lives find that they are full. Full to overflowing. Great is thy faithfulness. Morning by morning new mercies I receive. Will lack nothing. Those who do not let a day go by without reading God's word, without praying, are usually a living testimony of contentment. You see, they taste and see that the Lord is good. Because they take it daily. They don't just read it to a Sunday. They get into it each day. Those who study faithfully and reflect on the word of God go even further than that. They experience the fullness of Christ because the word of God is a powerful weapon that cuts through the daily rivers of life and leaves us at peace in every and every situation. The Christian will face difficult times. The Christian will face unbearable times just like any other human being. But they love Christ to carry them through. Others who do not take those steps of faith often find their lives full, not with the fullness of Christ, but full of anxieties and discontentment, bitterness and regret. How did Paul ever learn such contentment? Well, by experience. Takes time. Doesn't happen overnight. We have many prayer topics we'll pray about. But one prayer topic should be of great importance in our lives is this Lord, teach me to be content whatever my circumstances. Lord, teach me to be content whatever my circumstances. It's hard for a true Christian to be treated of the luxuries of life because we feel it's unnatural for us to be comfortable and to have too much especially when others are suffering but like Paul it's necessary to learn how to be content in God when we maybe have little and especially also when we're in plenty the secret of being content is always trust God's providence To fully trust the Lord's sovereignty in our lives. In other words, to live in Christ and to experience Him in our daily lives. Experience Christ in all situations. That's the secret of contentment. Experiencing Christ in all situations. Verse 13. At first I shared with the children, I can do everything through Him who gives me strength. How can we understand this verse when so many and so often this word of truth is taken totally out of context and abused to one's own benefit? 
When Paul said these words, he was talking about the strength he needed to accept and live in the circumstances God put him through in life, whether good or not. All things or everything should be translated within the context of God's will for my life, for your life as an individual. Doesn't mean that I can go go and jump off the roof of your house. Because in everything God gives me strength. No, we need to be sensible, friends. We need to be causes. Doesn't mean that you can pass an exam or get an A and best mark on that exam by not doing any studying. You'll need to put the work in. You can't just say it because you didn't pass the exam rule. Obviously that wasn't God's rule for my life. You still need to give out your all in God's strength. Of course I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. But I can only do those things that are within his will for me. We can only do those things that are within his will for you or for me. You too need to function within the context of his will in your life. If Christ is your Lord and Saviour, then he is your head. And you need to go where your head wants you to go. The moment your life leaves the context of his will, your life will become a shipwreck. It will run aground. Yes, you can do everything. Everything within his will. God's will for your life, for my life, and his perfect timing. And that's an enormous encouragement for each of us. Whatever God has designed for you or for me, we can do it. You can do anything and everything the Lord has already determined for your life. Whatever he wills for you, and puts in your heart and divine conviction through the Holy Spirit, you can certainly do it. But not alone or on your own. He himself will strengthen you to do it through the Holy Spirit. At the same time, as verse does not promise unlimited power for you to do whatever you want. But if you open your ears to hear him, and I used to see what he's teaching you. You will surely do everything and anything he's planned for your life. But not in your own strength. In his. When you abide in him. And he in you. And his strength drives your life. Nothing can stop the Lord's will. From being fulfilled in your life. To do as however we must be firmly rooted. And remain in the word of God. Friends, this morning, unless you know the Word of God, you won't know His will. People want their problems solved, but they want to solve them in their own ways. There's no way to solve them except in the Word of God. How much Bible reading do you do? If any. How much time do you give to Bible study? To know his will, you have to know his word. That's not memorizing Bible verses, and that's a great thing to do. But it's getting into his word each day of your life. Reading it like a daily newspaper. Not leaving it sitting on the shelf gathering dust. If you are experiencing plenty, and your life is from the Lord and you need strength to understand it and live in it according to his will and purpose. Or if you are experiencing hardship, it too may be from the Lord and intended to strengthen you to endure it and to rise from it a greater servant. Maybe in the future something that you've came through or going through currently, you'll be able to help someone facing the same. 
but you, not, but you will not endure it by your own strength, nor by borrowing the strength of others. You must stand in Christ's strength alone to fulfill your destiny in Christ Jesus. Paul was happy that the Church of Philippi had sent financial support. He was happy for the renewed concern for him, as well as for the gospel work he was doing. Because that goes together, Paul and his gospel work. These people had been with him from the start, sharing in this hardship. Ever since they received the gospel, young as they were spiritually, they had fulfilled the word of God, for his commands us to share in the Lord's blessings with those who are serving the gospel of life. They shared with him by supplying his needs. They shared with him, therefore, in the work of life he was doing. Paul didn't, certainly didn't look for gifts from them, nor for material support. He was content in all that God blessed him, with whether in plenty or not. But Paul was happy that they were participating in the gospel work by supporting his needs and the needs of those who accompanied him on his missionary journeys. He tells them, however, that what he was looking, if not gifts from them, he tells them that he was looking for what would be credited to their account in heaven. He was talking about their heavenly treasures that the Lord Jesus talked about in living his life. We can either build up wealth here for our own comforts and security, or we can build up treasures in heaven. How precious are those who freely give so that the church of the living God may not suffer or lack or need, but have enough in the work of God to continue unhindered. There are sacrifices. Ours were told a fragrant offering acceptable to God. Verse 19, And my God will meet all your needs according to his glorious riches in Christ Jesus. Surely your God who loves and cares for his church will supply all our needs and the need of his church so we might engage fully in Bible teaching and the world mission he has called us to be part of. The book of Philippians, book of joy, book of giving off when we're not following God's word, but a book of directions, a book to help us, to encourage us. I can do everything through him who gives me strength. Who this morning are you rooted in? This world or Christ Jesus? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this letter to the church in Philippi. We thank you for the teachings contained that were within it. Lord, this morning may each of us look inwardly and examine ourselves where we stand or with you. May we also be encouraged that with your help, nothing is impossible if it's within your will. Lord God, let us be willing to serve you, to give you all the praise and all the glory not seeking to do anything for our own self-interest or gain, but always looking to Christ. Amen. We join together now in our final hymn of praise that will come up on the screen. Just as I am without one plea, but that thy blood was shed for me, and that thy bids me come to thee, O Lamb of God, I come, I come.
Let us pray. We thank you, Lord, that we can come just as we are. And you, with open arms, will welcome us home. If we repent and put our faith and trust in you as our Lord and Saviour. And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, rest, remain and abide with each one of us, this day and forevermore. Amen.